pleasure to talk to you today about the evolution of RNA-seq, a technology that uh, we at EA have been using for a number of years now. Uh, I can advance my slide here. Like we just need to uh, re-click on that PowerPoint. Yeah, that, unfortunately I did. Uh, yeah, just click on the PowerPoint and then again. There we go. I did. Okay. All right. So uh, I'd like to give you the outline of what I uh, want to talk to you about today. I'm going to give you a brief history of, of RNA-seq, both in terms of uh, the utility of it, uh, what makes RNA-seq different than uh, doing other kinds of sequencing, and also the platforms and their usage. I'll talk about some definitive advantages of RNA-seq. Uh, I'll talk about the, uh, the reduced level of run-to-run -run variation that we see with RNA-seq as compared to other kinds of, of RNA-based technologies. I'll talk about its flexibility and, and the fact that it's, it's like having four assays in one. I'll also talk about the progress in RNA-seq. Uh, and this progress is on multiple dimensions, including allowing for uh, lower and lower input amounts as part of your uh, starting material for your assay, you know, the cost and the ability then to do uh, higher and higher read depths, and also uh, various methods in the protocol that allow us to either remove unwanted material for measurement or select for specific material for measurement to focus in on the parts of the RNA that uh, most matter to uh, the investigator. I'll also talk about some myths about RNA-seq. For example, uh, some think that RNA-seq may have very little protocol effects given that there's little run-to-run -run variation, but that isn't necessarily true. I'll also talk about uh, absolute quantification and, and what actually is possible from, from RNA-seq on that regard. And also, uh, what methods are suitable for analysis of RNA-seq data? And it turns out it's not just the counting-specific methods. And then I'll conclude. So if you look at RNA in research studies, you know, a typical goal for uh, RNA is to uh, quantify uh, absolute or relative levels of each RNA species related to different conditions. And these conditions may be related to uh, uh, understanding uh, particular diseases such as cancer. They may be uh, trying to understand exposure uh, to different uh, elements. They may be trying to examine the effect of treatments or particular drugs. They may be looking at different expression within different organs or different types of cells, for example, like in blood or, or PBMCs. Uh, they can also be examining RNA in the development phases uh, of uh, particular organisms, as well as cell cycle phases. Now, most RNA applications, are, in the end, are trying to determine differential expression or, or differential regulation uh, of different RNA molecules or, or related molecules, or as use as a biomarker or, or even a diagnostic. And until the last few years, most attention was placed on uh, poly-A RNA, sometimes referred to as messenger RNA. But other RNAs are becoming, uh, uh, are becoming uh, or having increasing interest becoming more popular to examine, especially smaller non-coding RNA. And these include things like microRNA, link RNA, uh, snow RNAs, and, and various others. Now the challenges are that there may be over 150,000 different RNA species in human cells. Uh, for example, UCSC known gene now has uh, greater than 100,000 different RNA transcripts to find. And just to show you how uh, that has changed over the years, in 2008, uh, it we thought that there was less than 60,000 different RNA species uh, in human cells. So quite a change just in a few years. And a lot of that has been made possible by the use of technologies such as RNA-seq. Now, if we look at the future from several years ago, I wanted to uh, uh, examine a paper by Wang that appeared in Nature Reviews Gen Genetics in, in January 2009 that talked about RNA-seq as being potentially a revolutionary tool for examining transcriptomics. And in 2009, RNA-seq was foreseen as being high throughput and therefore lower cost than, much lower cost than Sanger, uh, not limited to known sequence and allowing us to examine novel transcripts or exon-exon junctions or even uh, new organisms or novel organisms, uh, low if any background signal, and to be accurate uh, with quantitative PCR and other spike in. And since that time, I think uh, we have seen that this is true for the most part. Certainly, RNA-seq has become high throughput. Uh, we know its capabilities for looking at novelty. 
Uh, we also know that, in general, it has low, if any, background signal, especially for protocols such as PolyA. Occasionally, for other protocols I'll talk about later, where maybe you're depleting ribosomal RNA, there is a possibility for a background signal. But for the most part, uh, it's certainly true that RNA-seq generally has very low background. And therefore, increased dynamic range over the, the technologies that were uh, you know, around in 2009, and really, for the most part, uh, uh, today. And then related to accuracy with qPCR, it certainly is accurate in terms of estimating fold change. Whether or not you get the same numbers in terms of absolute quantity is actually one of the items I'll speak to later. Now, that paper also discussed some other things in terms of what was, was going to be needed in the future. And certainly, one of the items that was thought to be needed in 2009 was more development of kits for various specialized purposes, for example, dealing with lower integrity samples or dealing with specialized samples. Uh, also, it was viewed that a lot more bioinformatics was going to be needed to do this type of analysis well. And that includes things such as more software, uh, including things such as aligners, quantifiers, uh, things to uh, do data and file manipulation because of the large amounts of data as well as data analysis. Also, more hardware was, was going to be needed and more people because the back-end processing now is becoming uh, possibly more complex than the front end of the processing of wet labs.